something with you after Savoy. What a perfect holiday. Savoy, where we can glide and sway. Savoy, let me snuck away with you. Alicia for your beautiful voice and sharing your gift with us on this morning. Thank you so much. Greetings, everyone. Feel free to share your love for Alicia in the chat and give her a round of applause. We are thankful for our partnership with the Jazz Institute and equipping young people like Alicia to be their best selves. So yes, thank you. Welcome to the Black Women's Leadership Brunch. Please share in the chat where you're coming from and how you are feeling on this morning. I am Bianca Cotton, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator for UCAN. We believe that youth who have suffered trauma can be our future leaders. And we are proud of our approach to ensuring DEI uh, is impactful and unrivaled. Without further ado, our opening keynote speaker is Congresswoman Kelly. Congresswoman Kelly, thank you for being here today and for your hard work on the Hero for Youth Act, which provides further tax incentives for companies hiring youth employees beyond summer employment. I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Bianca for inviting me and good morning, everyone. I really appreciate being able to speak at this year's Black Women's Leadership Brunch. I know that as Black women, we have faced tough times, especially over these last few years. Today though, I wanna focus on our accomplishments and our power. Today is an opportunity to celebrate our accomplishments, something I know we don't always stop to do. Thank you to UCAN for organizing this opportunity for celebration. And thank you to that wonderful singer. Last March, I became the first ever black person and woman to lead the Democratic Party of Illinois. I joined a group of black women who I admire for their hard work in breaking the glass ceiling and ensuring that black women have a seat at the table. In this role, I'm working to ensure that the party is more diverse, and open and active. Over the past couple of years, we have seen Black women take charge nationally and finally be recognized for their contributions, for their intelligence, and for their leadership. 
In 2020, we elected our first ever Black female Vice President, Kamala Harris. After serving as a remarkable Senator from California, we now have Vice President Harris leading the way from the White House and ensuring that Black women have representation in the highest office of our country. Also in the White House, we have a young woman named Shawanza Golf, serving as Deputy Director of the White House Office of Legislative Affairs. Shawanza demonstrated her legislative expertise in her prior role as floor director in the House of Representatives. She was the first Black woman to ever serve in that position. I came to know Shawanza in that role, and while we were so sad to lose her in the House of Representatives, I know she is doing great things in the White House. We have one of my closest former colleagues and a woman I respect so much, Marsha Fudge, serving as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Secretary Fudge is a fierce advocate for safe and affordable housing, and she has already been to Chicago and her leadership has been felt. I know she will be looking out for all of those who depend on public housing. Also from the House of Representatives, we've seen another young Black woman come into her own as Deputy Director and now Acting Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Former Staff Director of the House Appropriations Committee, Shalanda Young, will soon be confirmed as the first Black woman to lead this powerful office. When it comes to public health services, we have a Black woman in charge there as well, Shaquita Brooks LaShore is the first Black woman to lead the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. I've had the opportunity to work closely with her on several occasions, and recently we each attended and spoke at the White House's first ever Maternal Health Day of Action, which Vice President Harris hosted. In Congress, so much of my work is centered on health equity and improving health outcomes for people of color. Having a Black woman leading CMS is so impactful in ensuring that our health policy and programs account for the many, many, many years of ignorance and racism that has resulted in worse health outcomes for Black Americans. And soon, and very soon, President Biden will nominate our first ever Black female Supreme Court Justice. We are not only witnessing history, but we are making it. Having Black women in these positions of power will ensure that our nation is finally not only taking us into account, but prioritizing us and listening to us also. I'm so proud to work with these outstanding women and to have them leading the way because we still have a lot of work to do. Much of my work in Congress is centered on equity and advancing women. I serve as co-founder and co-chair of the Caucus on Black Women and Girls. Last year, we released the first ever report on the state of Black women and girls. In our report, we outlined some of the key issues where we need to focus our legislative and programmatic efforts to do better for Black women and girls. We recommended legislation we should prioritize in Congress to improve disparities that we are facing in criminal justice, in health equity, in education, and in financial literacy. We know that the pandemic has only exacerbated these issues. One of those is our ability to participate in the workforce and earn for our families. We're witnessing a historic she session. Not only have women been forced to make the difficult decision to leave the workforce during the pandemic, but women have also not been returning to the workforce as quickly as our male peers. Of course, this she session is disproportionately impacting Black women and will have generational impacts on wealth and earning potential for many years to come. We must pass the Build Back Better Act to assist with affordable childcare, paid leave, more affordable and accessible health care, expanded postpartum care, and so much more to help Black women get back to work. As vice chair of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, I've also been working with some of my colleagues on a racial equity working group. Our task is to identify and prioritize legislation that will contribute to racial equity. We've outlined 40 pieces of legislation we see as key for advancing opportunity and justice for people of color. 
We've also communicated with industry leaders about the importance of increasing the number of Black women in their executive boards and C-suite positions. I am confident that this working group is going to help us get some important legislation moving soon. A generation from now, when our daughters and granddaughters are leading the way, I hope that we will hardly recognize the world and that those who questioned our power or our seat at the table will be a distant memory. Black women have more power than ever before, and I cannot wait for the world to watch us realize our full potential as we are finally allowed to take our, our charge and show everyone what we're made of, and we're taking our charge. Thank you again for inviting me to speak today, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Kelly, for all that you do have done and will continue to do on the behalf of Black women and girls across uh, our districts and the world. Thank you for being a pioneer in your beautiful remarks on today. Thank you. Today, we have a phenomenal, power-packed panel of Black women leading with excellence on their own terms. I hope you have your notebooks and your pens ready because the gems will be shared. Our moderator is Robin Robinson, a longtime Chicago television news anchor. And without further ado, Robin Robinson, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Bianca, it is definitely my pleasure to be here again, invited back to UCAN's Black Women's Leadership Brunch. Uh, just on a personal note, if y'all hear some banging in the background, there is a man on a ladder outside my window breaking up the ice dam on my roof. Now, this is the only time he could be here. And as you know, we got to keep a roof off our head. We don't want it leaking because we got weather coming across the country. Black History Month. Uh, the joke is it's the shortest month of the year. It is, however, the most history packed month of the year. So today is February 16th. What happened on February 16th in black history? Uh, thank you, Google, uh, because we can stuff it at our fingertips. So starting from far back, Frederick Douglass elected to the um, president of the Freedmen's Bank and Trust on February 16th, 1874. We talk about a lot of work to be done. To be clear, there are fewer black owned banks today than there were in the mid 19th century. So in 1960, there were more Black-owned banks than there are today. Uh, let's think about progress in terms of where we've been, where we're going. We all wanted Black-owned banks, but we also wanted regular banking in Black neighborhoods. And as soon as they went in, it kind of disempowered the Black-owned banks who, who had less capital. But now we got, you know, we got Chase on the corner, but we don't have Seaway. So also on February 16th in Black history, we had, um, what was the next date? I want to get to... Uh, I want to get to the modern times. Uh, oh, in 19, no, that, I'll, I'll do that last. But Bessie Smith, her first recording was in 1923 for Columbia Records. Um, and uh, that was quite a thing. You know, it was, it's one thing to appropriate black music. It's another thing to actually uh, let them do the recording. Now, whether or not she maintained or retained publishing rights uh, where the money really is, is another thing altogether. And finally, I'm not gonna bring you too far forward, but in 1951, the New York City Council passes a bill prohibiting housing racial discrimination. And of course, we know there are plenty of laws and ordinances against that didn't necessarily stop the practice. It just, uh, it just made people find ways around it. So anyway, but here we are in 2022 at UCAN's um, annual Black Women's Leadership Front. We do have an amazing panel and can we have a big hand for um, uh, Alicia Monique for that amazing song, two songs that she gave us at the opening. I always say if I could sing, I'd be dangerous, but that's okay, I'm a great audience member. So let's start uh, introducing our panel. We, and thank you, uh, Congresswoman Kelly. The work that Congress is doing is so important. The whole legislative uh, situation in this country we know is a, is a bit divided and divisive, but uh, people like you, uh, will keep us on the right side of history, we certainly hope. So let's start with Kiana Cornish, who is Senior Management of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Programs at Sodexo. Those of you who don't know what Sodexo is, it is huge. It is a Paris-based firm uh, that does 
has a global footprint, like 400,000 employees, 22 billion euro in revenues every year. And the um, uh, Kiana manages diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm gonna ask her a little bit later if that's a, a new role, okay? That everybody suddenly in 2020 decided, oh, we better do something about this and, and how that's working out for her. Dr. Cheryl White, I also wanna point out that uh, Kiana is in, is in Brooklyn. So we got a nationwide panel for you today. And on the other side of the coast in, from San Diego, from the Neighborhood House Association, which is, when, I know it's one of the largest providers of human service uh, programming in San Diego County, but I think also in the, in the country. And Dr. White is a, um, a senior VP there. She is, when I love this term, a cultural psychologist. I, I feel like I need to ask you a question every single day <laughs> because I got a lot, a, lot of, a lot of questions about the mental state of our culture. And she has 25 years experience facilitating consensus building, positive engagement dynamics, and planned change commitments. And change is what we're all probably about much of the time in both our professional and personal lives. So I want to welcome uh, Dr. White and, uh, you know, San Diego. I went to San Diego State, so you kind of might be like my homie. And we do have some, some people that we know in common. And um, my cousin, I mean, I claim her, her name is Robinson, Nicole Robinson, whom I first met when she was leading the Chicago Food Depository. And I mean, she led them up, 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 up the hill. So they just became a feeding machine that didn't just provide food for people, but also opportunities for people to create careers in the hospitality and food service industry. She really um, put in place, executed successfully a strategic plan that made the food depository much more than it was prior to her coming there. And now she's taking those same skills to the YWCA of Metro Chicago, recently named the uh, president and CEO of that, uh, well, maybe not president, just CEO, but that's okay, but we'll take that. And so congratulations to, to the YWCA for getting you, Nicole, not, not necessarily to you, because I know you've now got a crap ton of work. And um, Angelique Power, who is, uh, works out of Detroit, for the Skillman Foundation. So, you know, we all hear about the big foundations, MacArthur, and, um, but this is a very focused foundation. They give out like $24 million in grants every year and they are focused on empowering the youth of Detroit. I love that. I love that, that, that someone uh, that of us is, is empowering us and, and deciding who gets that money to do something that's gonna improve our future. So Angelique, we really appreciate you joining us uh, today. And um, she used to be the uh, uh, president of the of the Field Foundation for those of, for those Chicagoans on board who are who are wondering how, how she got to be the head of this other foundation. It was it's been a journey, and we want to hear about that. And finally, well, not finally. I think I got one more. Nope, it is finally. Uh, you can, which is our host for today's brunch, uh, recently named a new president and CEO, and she is Inglewood's own Krista Hamilton. And um, this is a 153-year-old youth services organization. And though they didn't begin this way, in modern times, they are serving primarily um, African-American and young people of color who find themselves uh, in, in need of, of something in place of a, of, a, of a stable family situation, right? It started out as an orphanage, but it's really a, a multi-service full family, whole family, whole community service organization. Uh, and way back 135 years ago, it wasn't even for black people. And now we have the first ever African-American, the first ever African-American woman as president and CEO of UCAN. And I think that is something that, that we can all applaud. So thank you for all of you for being here today. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, without giving anyone's individual um, personal stats out, let me just tell the audience, you have a range of generations represented here. We did a little poll before we got on and you got from age 29 to age 66. I'll leave it up to you to guess who's who and who's in between. But we got, we got, it, we got it pretty much covered in terms of the, the grown up life and work situation. Krista, I wanna start with you. Um, you have not been at, you. how long have you had, when were you named about three months ago to the president? John November 13th. Wow, brand new. Brand new and uh, right. So and and from your background, um, the journey from where you started to where you are, what what do you what 
did you see yourself in, in a position like this? Um, no, not at a nonprofit. <clears throat> So, you know, I start, I went to Florida A&M University. Um, I, I majored in business. I have two business degrees. So I knew I wanted to, to lead a business. Um, but initially, right out of college, I went to Walgreens. I worked for the Walgreens company. Um, I worked at the store level, then I worked in corporate, and it just was not for me, right? Um, luckily, I mean, I love to see that Walgreens is now being led by a Black woman, so that warms my heart. Um, but at the time that I was there, which is you know, about 15, 17 years ago, um, you know, diversity was still not at the top of the list. Um, and I was working really hard to, to move the needle on some things. Um, but I said, you know what, I'm going to take my gifts, my talents, my education to the community. So, you know, I love the people that continue to fight the, the good fight there. Um, there's great people working at the organization. But for me, I wanted to just move into a more community-based setting. So I already I always do some volunteer work. Um, I'm always a person who's been connected to my immediate community. So it was it was great to transition into the nonprofit field over 10 years ago. I started at an organization centers for New Horizons. I worked there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I was promoted to the CEO and executive director there for the last seven years. Um, so now I'm, I'm at UCAN, right? So transitioning to UCAN, um, and I learned so much of that organization that I'm able to bring to this organization. So although I'm new, um, you know, I understand the role, I understand the people. I was on the South side, now I'm on the West side, um, but the needs are the same. So I, you know, I've been able to hit the ground running. You on the right side, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> For doing what's right. Um, I have to say, uh, we've all been going through something, right? I, these last couple of years have been the longest decade of our lives in some cases. Uh, and so I'm wondering how uh, all of the, the changes, you know, the pandemic, the civil unrest, kind of the highlighting of the division over uh, uh, race and equity, how has it impacted, uh, and I'll, anyone that would like to answer first, I, I'm, I'm fine. How has it impacted you all personally and professionally? I'll jump in. I mean, I I live in Detroit now. So that's the when you talk about the great resignation, you know, I, I talk about this time as like the great pause. So I lived in Chicago. I ran the Field Foundation. I love Chicago. I love my community. I miss my community and I love my work. But when I was sitting in my home um, at the early parts of the pandemic and I started watching these uprisings happening, not just in Chicago, but around the world, I was seeing that these uprisings were led by black young people, brown young people. They were leading coalitions of multi-generations, multi-ethnic coalitions demanding wholesale systems change. And I thought to myself, I need to move all barriers away from these brilliant young visionaries so that they can lead us to where we need to go. And Detroit is a black city, it is a brown city, Michigan is a purple state, and it's a it's a place where they've been working on equity for a long time. So as Dr. Nicholas Pierce says, I, I am tying my soul to my role and trying to spend the time that I have on this planet getting the people who should be in charge in charge. Great. That's a, that is a, a great story. And before you know, hearing about you, I didn't even, didn't even know about the Skillman Foundation. So it's nice to know that there is like this big bucket, this this big bucket of money um, that is really focused on the empowerment of young black leadership. Uh, anybody else on on the last two years and how it's affected you, you know, emotionally, physically, spiritually? Um, I could jump in on this. Uh, I'll say that um, you know it, it's a, an awakening. I feel like even though we had this moment in the last two years, it's the moment that we've been waiting for. I know that it has been exhausting and draining for people, but it was um, the, the opportunity to shine a light on the inequities that we've known about um, for decades that people have been researching, writing about, uh, artists have been telling stories about it, uh, journalists, a, a lot of them women, uh, you know, the head of public radio is a woman, uh, Natalie Moore uh, wrote some great work around that. So we've been learning. So I felt like, um, at least when I was leading the, at the food depository, 
that it was the moment to whip out all the strategies that we already had, uh, use the data that we already had to advance the opportunities um, that we weren't able to do before. And we're still in that moment because we have a, a Build Back Better initiative that our federal government is leading. There's $1.9 billion that's coming into our city in Chicago, another billion coming into the county. The state is getting money. And it's, a, it's an opportunity to write what was wrong, to change the policies that created the situations that we're in. So I feel like as, as much as it was draining, I mean, I was, there were moments I was hanging on a string. Uh, we ha had those moments where we were trying to find restoration wherever we could through our family, through our friends. Um, but, you know, Bell Hooks has a great quote. I love Bell Hooks. She just passed. And she talks about this idea that true resistance begins when people confront pain and want to do something to change it. And I feel like we're at this moment of collective woke hope and healing, right? We got to do it all together, but this is our moment. Uh, Black women, you know, kind of to Angelique's point, are at the center of it uh, and we're showing it, we're doing it, and there's no turning back. We got to recharge so that we can move forward. Black women are at the center of a lot mm -hmm. of the, the various storms. And I was recently uh, became aware of a new term called the glass cliff, which is research-based that says that more often than not, when an organization or a, a company is like on the precipice of like falling apart, that's when a black woman gets a shot. Uh, so you, you break through the glass ceiling, take one step, don't take a big step, because you might fall off the glass cliff. Uh, and, and, and that to me is, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're the ones for the, for the job, but how do you, how do you make sure that, 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 that ground, whether it's glass or whatever it is beneath your feet, doesn't crumble? How do you kind of demand the support that you need in order to lead an organization into a better place? Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder from an international perspective, because as uh, Nicole mentioned, you know, this unrest and, and this kind of, hey, we are not just going to pretend it's not happening anymore in terms of racial um, inequities uh, and, and downright racism, um, it was worldwide. And Sodexo is a, 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 a based in France, and there were, there were many, you know, the, the French like to protest. <laughs> and so they were very active on this as well. And so I'm wondering, Kiana, your role, do you feel like that was a direct result or was this something that Sodexo was always focused on, but you naming you as uh, the senior manager of diversity, equity and inclusion, do you feel like uh, there's some new fuel in that? You know, and, and just to quickly go back to your first question of how I have gotten through, uh, you know, this pandemic, just to quickly say, I have truly learned the meaning of having faith the size of a mustard seed. And that has gotten me through so much within these past two years. Um, but to answer your question, you know, I, I am a black woman who is still early in my career. You know, I'm still navigating. I'm still finding my place, fully finding my voice. Um, but I do have relationships with the women who are well into their careers as chief diversity officers, directors. And I remember prior to joining Sodexo, I've been at Sodexo for a month now, a last week made one month. And, you know, I asked them, I asked a lot of them. No, the question, yes. um, thank you. Um, do you think that you landed that leadership position because you're black? And unfortunately, a lot of them said yes. And, you know, I feel as if a lot of organizations were in a frenzy with finding talent, um, specifically talent of color. Um, and for me, I, I don't think that I was on the journey to get a leadership role, a senior manager role. I was more so on a journey to make a change. And so I, I, you know, I think that the role came about at its perfect time, but, you know, to be completely honest, I do feel as if it was a, an opportunity that came about because these organizations and specifically Sodexo needed to make a statement, needed to show that they were interested in hiring women of color in management positions um, and that they were dedicated to the change. And, you know, and of course, so many women like myself, we say yes to these opportunities because it's more money, um, it's more visibility, 
Um, but when you think more about the opportunity, you know, if it's based on talent or merit, um, you know, it, it does sometimes seem as if, and, and it is because of the glass cliff kind of outlook on things. And so that has been my experience. And then, you know, in addition to that, I just say, even if that is the case, let me just go in and do what I know I want to do and make the change that I know I want to make and not really worry about too much of what other people's motives are. And so that's what keeps me going. I love that. You kind of, you're, they, the company's been forced into glory, whatever yeah. the reason. And if, you, and, if, and if you got the role because you're black, the whole bunch of roles we didn't get because we're black. So, right. you know, I think, I think it's, you know, it's kind of a turnabout is fair play and it's what you do with it. So congratulations. And we, we, and, and they're listening, right? So it's not like they can just put you in that role and say, look, we got a black girl over there, right? They're going to have to, they're going to have to uh, prove some performance. Mm -hmm. um, Cheryl, Dr. White, I like, anybody mm -hmm. who's going through the trouble to become a doctor, I want to be sure I put doctor in front of their name. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're in, the, in, in, in mm -hmm. a, a, the Neighborhood House Association, which has really been devoted to improving the lives of the disenfranchised and the, and the underdog uh, for, I don't know how many years. I've, I've gone from San Diego for 40 years, and I know they were Over 100. Mm -hmm. Over 100, right? So similar mm -hmm. to UCAN. And, mm -hmm. you know, we all know that the, the, the disproportionate need is among the Black community. Mm -hmm. um, as a cultural psychologist, do you see this moment of kind of a mass awareness um, uh, as, a, as a good thing that's gonna be good for our, our, our psyche? I have, um, so I'm gonna do like Kiana and go back to your first question too. Okay. This has been a very frustrating time for me, uh, quite honestly. I, I see that um, <clears throat> in the midst of us pushing for change, in the midst of us um, wanting to think about um, closing the gaps and the gaps with regards to health disparities. I was frustrated beyond, beyond um, with regards to, uh, I can't tell you how many essays I wrote and how many essays I, I wrote to uh, elected officials and everyone else you could think about regarding something as simple as distributing N95 masks from the beginning, when I first learned in March of 2019 that an N95 mask could help um, the wearer protect themselves from the COVID-19 um, virus. And so it was very frustrating to know that this tool was available and yet you have to be a person of means. And, um, and this country decided that making ventilators was something we could do. We could use the Defense Protection Act to make ventilators, but not to make N95 masks and distribute them to people who needed them so for, for survival. Many black and brown people on the front lines, many, many jobs could have used that. And so the fact that they were uh, systematically not provided irked the heck out of me. And every time I would see you know, a thousand, two thousand people dying daily in this country and something as basic, you're making ventilators, but not something to prevent it. So I, I've seen this as um, hopeful, helpful with regards to things moving forward, but still right in our faces in very basic and simple ways. Um, privilege is smacking you know, it's like there were people who understood and knew this, right? But did not provide this. And is it because they don't want to use their privilege to, I just don't understand it or know it. So I was grateful for my own privilege, but frustrated that the privilege was not being provided in ways, simple ways that could help um, make a difference for those who did not have. And every time I'd say put a piece of cloth on your face, it drove me crazy because I knew that that cloth gave a person 25% protection. A surgical mask gave them about 50% protection where N95 would have given them 95% protection from this virus. So frustrating period for me. And, but also enlightening. So from in terms of how we see things, is there, mm -hmm. I know we're all looking for the silver lining of the last mm -hmm. couple of years with the pandemic. 
what is, mm -hmm. do you see one? I definitely see a, a silver lining. You know, uh, Martin Luther King, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, we must accept finite disappointment, but never give up infinite hope. So in the midst of it, you know, I say hopeful and um, continue the journey. And my sister circle of which, you know, I know we have uh, friends in common. Mar poor Marsha has heard my mask lecture a zillion times as have many others. And so we, we continue to move forward and we make a difference where we can, how we can. And um, so, yes, I see a silver lining in love and friendship. Love and friendship and, and awareness. Home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's awareness mm -hmm. at a corporate level. We were just talking to uh, Kiana mm -hmm. about Sodexo. So mm -hmm. a lot of women that are, um, and men that are in our mm -hmm. audience probably want to know, you know, if you have some advice for overcoming some of the obstacles on their journey up mm -hmm. to the C-suite, or maybe they're already there. So could I ask this question? What do you think the biggest obstacle, uh, name one, I know there's probably multiple, uh, facing Black women yeah, who are on a leadership path right now or already leading at work or at home. Maybe it's an obstacle at home. <laughs> you know, I'll say exposure and opportunity to learn and grow. Um, I was very fortunate, but I, I know that I, I was fortunate because I changed my career trajectory. Um, you know, working at a big corporation like Walgreens, it was, you know, you you had a job and that was the job that you were there to do. It wasn't really stretch assignments. Um, there wasn't many opportunities unless you had someone to sponsor you in that way. So you would have to align yourself with the person who is who is going to take on that charge to put you in the right position. Um, at a smaller nonprofit, I had the opportunity <laughs> at nonprofits, you got to do everything anyway, right? <laughs> so I got to learn HR and finance and all these amazing things. Um, and, you know, I also had people that rallied around me to support me because they saw that I was interested in doing it. So they gave me the opportunities to, to lead in that way. Um, and, and I'm going to say, you know, just real quick, Robin, um, your question about Black women getting put in these seats, you know, I do think the organizations have to be prepared for what that looks like and what that means. I come after 152 years of white men, um, great men that have done amazing things with this organization, but I'm a Black woman, right? And and, and my needs are different, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm sure my PR person um, at the organization is on the call. You know, he'll say, "Well, we're doing an interview tomorrow." Well, I'm a black woman. I can't do an interview tomorrow. I got to get my hair appointment. You know, I got to get myself together. I don't, you know, I'm not. I'm so we have to think about it differently, like diversity, um, what that looks like when you have a different type of person in the seat. I was walking a bank around the organization one day, and it was raining outside. And they just start walking out the door. And I'm like, wait a minute, it's raining. We can't just walk across the street and pray. Give me a second, right? So just thinking about like, what does that look like to have a, a woman in those seats um, and, and a black woman in those seats? Like we have our own sets of priorities and needs as well. But I think my organization has done an amazing job of, you know, they're doing the best that they, they can to support me, give me an executive coach, give me the things that I need. Um, they mm. prepare for the transition. And I think that is critical for organizations to think about, you know, what does that look like to have a different type of person in, in the seat when they move forward and make those decisions? Um, if I can just piggyback off of what Krista said, you know, I think that all women are under pressure to conform to dominant masculine behavior norms, but I think Black women in particular are also, you know, under pressure to conform to dominant white behavior norms. So it's like we're under pressure to change how we dress, how we wear our hair, how we speak. And as a Black woman, we want to avoid being seen as angry or aggressive, and it really does become a second job, you know, in addition to our primary job. And then we end up feeling burnt out, uh, you know, and it affects the way we show up at work. So, you know, when everyone else gets to show up um, and focus solely on their job, we have to think about all of these other things, like our hair getting wet in the rain, you know, and so I think that is definitely high on the long list of challenges for Black women in the workplace. So overcoming that. How, what's, the, what's the best strategy? I, I would point out that when I was on TV, they, they said, you can't wear print. You can't wear floral. Uh, look at them today. They, they, the men are wearing floral. So things do change. How do you become part of the change? I think speaking- I, Oh, sorry, Kiana, go on. 
Yeah, no, just really quickly, I think speaking up and using the calling in versus calling out method, you know, if we don't speak mm. up, don't, you know, let people know why it's wrong and why it makes our experience in the workplace that more difficult, they will never know. And even if they do know, they're not being called in about it, having those open conversations uh, where you are educating and just speaking, you know, about what the challenges are. So I think that's one way to, you know, uh, solve that issue. Mm. Sorry, and you, and you were going to say, Angelique? You know, I was going to say that what you said the first time you talked to Kiana has like stayed with me. My heart started beating faster when you made that comment about being asked, like, did you get this job because you're a black woman? Did you get, are you in this role because you're a black woman? And I think it ties to the question you're asking now, Robin, um, like, what has that question been asked for all the mediocre white men who have been running different roles? Like, did you get the, the Peter principle was actually named after like mediocre white men who fail upward, who are promoted in their role. And, and what I wanted to say is that getting the job because you're a black woman means that you are bringing extra to the job. Like you are bringing skills, you are bringing grace, you are bring, being, bringing the ability to mitigate uncomfortable situations, to push things forward. And so I, I mean, I had the same feeling in 2020, my phone was ringing off the hook. I was like, oh, everyone's looking for a black woman who understands racial justice. But the question is, what do we do when we are there? Mm -hmm. Are we window dressing? Or are we the architects of something different? Mm -hmm. You know, that I think is the way that I feel, you know, I move myself through the world. So I'm sitting in the seat. It's not about the seat. It's about changing the system, the policies, the practices, so that you don't have to be asked that question again when you get through the door. So, you know, there are a lot of black women in leadership. Get ready because we are architects and Organizations are lucky to have us. Love that. Anybody else want to, want to add to that? Oh my gosh, I'm jumping up and down in my seat, Angelique, because <laughs> uh, you articulated uh, that so well. And I'll say that I actually share a similar career path to Krista in the sense that I spent a good part of my career at Kraft Foods and Mondelez International in finance. So I didn't start, and I'm a kid from the South Side, went to public schools, uh, navigated systems and benefits, waited on housing vouchers. So I just wanted a job. So yeah, my heart was in a lot of other things, but I said, you know, let me go this route. And I learned a lot. And, and Chris is right, you know, environments can be, be toxic. Um, but I also, it, it goes back to, we have organizational cultures that are years and years and years old. They're centered on whiteness and how uh, white people work, how they, they have set up the structures and the system. So it e isn't even, to, it's about, you know, hair and things like that, but it's also, how are we collaborative? How do we even bring people to the table? How do we movement build and, and, and do drive consensus? Uh, Black women bring some unique skills around that, that no uh, other group does. Uh, I think what also happens in spaces like corporate America and other large scale institutions is that we have an underdeveloped kitchen cabinet. Again, I'm the kid from the South Side uh, that, that my network was small. It's grown now dramatically, but I, I, I came into situations. I can remember my first uh, you know, job, finance job out of college. I didn't have a car. I had to go get a car. The job was in the suburbs, but there were some black people in an employment resource group which people talk about those today. And they called me before I started work. And they said, do you need a ride? It's your first day and you're this little black girl and we wanna make sure you get to work today, right? Networks like that mm. help, right? They drive. Um, so I think that that's a huge mm -hmm. part. And then we do have to change the system while we're there, but we've been so institutionalized ourselves. We're working on ourselves about what it means to be an authentic leader at work and what do we bring to that work. The 21 year old Nicole couldn't have talked about my life quite in the same way that I can discuss and reflect on it now. 
And we have to bring that. We would, I, I was hiding myself at certain points in my career because I was trying to just navigate and they don't tell us how to navigate. That's not in the employee handbook. Uh, they, that sponsorship, this idea of, I want this kid to win. Black people in our historically, you know, large institutions with none of that in place. And to be honest, HR departments, others, so they're managing people. They're managing to the rules that are already in place and not transforming the rules. So I just, I want to belabor that. Um, you know, and it, it's people in my life who have helped me follow your heart. Because how did I get from finance to leading a historically uh, 150 year old, uh, historically white led institution led by women who have have pushed the role of black women out historically, when I know like, that's what I'm loving about this job now, because it's my job to unmute um our voice and to lift up the role that black women have played in creating this institution. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there, sorry. <laughs> Robin, I want to jump in and just kind of um, say, going back to your question, like how do we do it now? How do we lean in now? And what are some of the biggest uh, challenges that we face? You know, what I hear, what I've experienced um, is, you know, how do we bring the power that we have to bring to the table and not shrink um, in doing so um, because others, you know, it's like there's a lot of emotional regulation that we have to have in order to make it comfortable for others. And as Kiana was saying, that extra energy can be very draining. And I, you probably know Harold Tuck. I remember one of the things that Harold Tuck said um, years ago was the moment you lose your patience is the moment you lose. And there is a lot that will try our patience. So as Nicole, you know, kind of going back to that circle, having a friendship circle that allows you to be you, that allows you to just release it so you can go to the table and navigate being at the table and emotionally regulate at the table, but make sure you, your message is being delivered. But in a way, as Kiana, you were saying, it brings people in. You know, I'm not calling you out, I'm calling you in so we can have these conversations, but in a way where they can hear it. So we have to become masters at harnessing our own energy. Um, and as y'all can see, I got a lot of passion. So how do I harness all this passion in a way that doesn't scare the other person across the table. I remember one of the fire chiefs I worked with many years ago, and he was the only black on his on the executive team. He said, it's okay to look different, but it's not okay to be different. And he was so frustrated with the fact as to how he had to manage himself to show up to get his message heard. And it'd be nice if we didn't have to do that, but the reality, Robin, with regards to how do we, how can we be in the game now? We have to do it. And it requires a lot of extra energy. To do it so. does, but sometimes so we got to be able to release it someplace so we can come back and manage it in that space. All right. So I guess just jumping across the table and strangling somebody is not going to work. Um, <laughs> so Probably. Um, what, what strategies do you, I mean, what do you do? What do you practice? What, what kind of, what, how do you create that patience? Uh, are y'all mm -hmm. into yoga, meditation, massage, any, any, any suggestions? Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to jump in and say, um, Nicole mentioned that circle that reached out to her in her previous job, you know, mm -hmm. create that circle for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You got to have people that understand exactly what you do, how you do it. Um, I've been very fortunate to have women of color to reach out to me and I've created that circle and, you know, I've brought other people into that circle. So having that space, um, because nobody truly rec realizes like the level of pressure that you are under in this job, managing your personal life and all those things. Um, that, that we deal with. So I think for me, it's key. Also having a mentor um, along with that sponsor. So having mentors and also having colleagues that are your peers, uh, you know, that, that has done wonders for me. I, I want to clarify on that for a minute. The difference between a mentor and a sponsor. 
Anybody got so it? for me, I'll, I'll say for me on uh, my definition, a mentor is someone like privately, you know, they they will coach me. Um, you know, I'm able to talk to them and invent to them about things. Um, and they're really just privately providing me guidance. But sponsor is more so somebody that is putting you on a platform, right? Bringing you to the table, inviting you to. And a mentor can be both, but I think a sponsor has more of a. Um, a targeted approach. Like they they are trying to help you along the trajectory to whatever next is. Um, mentor is more to me like a coach, um, a, a little different than a friend, but somebody that's, hey, you know, calling you out, giving you feedback, um, that private, that that private relationship. More personal. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and does anybody uh, think it's helpful to uh, to realize that, you know, when we, we doubt that we have the skills or experience um, you know, to, or merit for a particular position, you know, there are people, uh, you know, who, who always say, yeah, I can do that, even though they have no idea what they're doing and jump up and be mediocre at it, right? We are always worried about not being qualified. Um, but it's, it, what's lacking is that generational, that this disparity has been going on for what, 13, 14 generations now, where you don't, you can't talk to your uncle, father, who ran this business or that business because we've been systemically shut out. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and say the, the word critical race theory, um, that that is the foundation of our condition. Uh, is it helpful to be aware of that or does that, <laughs> or does that just make us say, well, there's no hope? I'm just, I'm wondering if, if knowledge in terms of our history really is power. Yeah, I think we can do anything. I've never done a job that I already knew how to do. Every time you start a job, you learn how to do different aspects of it. And so I would, I say that we're going to always like ask ourselves those questions about how do you go into, I mean, when I first ran a foundation, the field foundation, I was like, do I know how to run investments? Do I know how to run a budget like this? Turns out, yes, you ask questions, you know? And so many people are pretending in those rooms that they already understand stuff. And what I found is that when I ask my questions, other people are, are released and they can ask their questions too. And so having a learning culture is really important. But Robin, and I feel like I'm always like two questions behind, but I do wanna answer your question that you asked about like, how do you take care of yourself? Um, and I always say like, I'm uh, the sister circle, Krista, 100%. Um, I always say I'm varsity at wine drinking because that helps as well. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I wanted to mention is a good therapist. And I think we're in a moment of like mental health and wellness. And we don't talk about this as much as we can in our own communities, but young people will talk about it. Young people will tell you that they are not doing okay and that they need to have someone help them. And what I always say is that I feel like I'm a fascinating novel and having someone who's gonna sit with me every week or every other week and unpack a chapter of my life and make connections that I never saw and like go deeper on certain parts, that is a gift. That is a day spa for the mind. There is no shame in that game. That is something that we all need to invest in our own mental health and wellness. I love that. And speaking of silver linings to the pandemic, the awareness of the fragility of our mental health, as well as suddenly, because I had checked previously, suddenly you can get your therapy virtually and your insurance will pay for it. They wouldn't do it before the pandemic. They couldn't do it. A lot of things they couldn't do, they suddenly realized they could when they had to during the pandemic. So um, but I guess my point about not having that that uh, generational privilege, right? That where the knowledge is kind of seeped into you at the dinner table. My father was a, a journalist with the black press, which is, would give me the idea that I too could be a storyteller for a living. Um, absent that, you know, I'm kind of starting a few steps behind others who come from that kind of generational empowerment. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, but I do see us paying a lot of attention to our history lately. And I guess I, 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 you know, some people have, you know, we've ignored it for a long time. So boy, is that depressing, but it's also not right. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think at this moment, that's a, that's a plus for me. Mm -hmm. Asking folks, hey, or, let, let, go could ahead. I comment go ahead. one thing on that? I, I actually think the historical part is inspiring. It's not depressing. Mm -hmm. right. It's exp Absolutely. inspiring to understand um, and learn about all the adversity that our ancestors have overcome. And as the uh, new CEO of the YWCA, uh, I've been having so much fun learning about the history of the Y 
Um, just recently, I was reflecting on, uh, there's a man named Howard Thurman, who is the sort of architect of the modern day civil rights movement. So Martin Luther King would lead it, but Thurman would uh, write extensively about this framework that he, he was inspired by when he went to India to, to see Gandhi. But on that trip with him was his wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, one of the unsung women of the civil rights movement. And it was Sue Bailey who would interrogate Gandhi about the fact that he had left out black people, South Africans in his framework of nonviolence and, and human rights and civil rights. And Sue Bailey would go on to, to come back to the States, work with Thurman and other leaders. She would become a leader within the YWCA. I never knew anything about Sue Bailey Thurman and her impact on civil rights and her impact on this institution that is the why until now. Mm -hmm. So wow. it's the history we need to know. Mm -hmm. yep. I tell you nothing I like better than, than driving on Ida B. Wells Drive. All right, and it's, I mean, I want somebody to say, well, who is that? Let me tell you, All right? So I do think that, that uncovering the history is important. To so people, um, uh, women that want to support each other, two things, and not just women. So uh, women, men, white men, Spanish men, Spanish men, everybody, right? How, how, what, are, what is something that folks can do at work or, or even personally to uh, help to empower this, this evolution of black women leading? For me, I would say the first thing is to speak up when you see another woman being mistreated in any way. You know, don't stay quiet. Sometimes I think the person who is being mistreated feels uncomfortable speaking up. So, you know, take the initiative to speak up for that person. Um, and secondly, I would say to encourage each other to just go for it. I think that women are uh, sometimes more prone to in, like intense self-doubt than men in the workplace. And so we need to be each other's cheerleaders, you know, and say, hey, you are ready for that new role or that new project project and I'm going to support you along the way. So I think, you know, within the last two years, I've been practicing that much more than I've done in the past. And I've seen the difference that it has made not only for me, but for other women as well. Great advice. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. We want people to go away with things to do, things that they can do, that they can employ um, that, are, that will lift us all. Is there anything, is anything anyone's done that made a difference for you? You know what, I would say Kiana's spot on, you know, speak up, but I would say start our own stuff. I think that's the most amazing thing that has also come out of the pandemic is that the, just Black women movement building. There's like Black women in tech, there's like uh, Black women lawyers, like there's all these groups. I'm a part of a group of uh, great women that started in my kitchen table called the South Side Giving Circle. We call ourselves queen makers. And we just, I just sent an email to some other black women in my community and said, if you live on the South Side and you care about the social, political and economic empowerment of black women and girls, come to my house and we're gonna talk about it. And, and trust me when I say women, they didn't even know what it was. They just said, I'm for it. I'm showing up. People who couldn't make it said, can you have another meeting? Uh, it was this, and then we asked them to write a check for $1,000 or more. And no one hesitated. People got a few words and say, here's the money. And see, that's the other thing. There, there's women in these positions and, and, and it's like, we can exert our power. So I would just say, if you got an idea, you got a notion, hold on to it. And it actually might just be possible. I love that. I don't know why I wasn't invited to Southside uh, Giving <laughs> Circle, but we'll talk about that later. So I like that. I, what a great idea it would be. Um, organizations uh, that you think are, 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 worth, are, are worthwhile um, really impactful. I know it probably changes region to region. So I'm going to ask uh, Angelique, and this question was not in, our, not in our possibilities, but what a great proposal that would be by some of your, uh, your, your leading young people to compile probably will be digital uh you know here's an organization you should join if you live in you know st louis and you're in this industry and you're black right so anybody have an organization that they really credit with uh with 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 fueling their journey mm -hmm. 
I will oh, say that, oh, some of my early go mentors. Ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Yeah, I was some, some of my early mentors uh, that worked with the San Diego Regional Youth Employment um, Office were very instrumental. I still think of Gay Davis. I was 16. Actually, I was probably 14 when she was first my counselor and sent me to the Red Cross for a summer job. And I went there two years. And then the third year, she says, you're going to stay here and work at the office with me. And so I think of Gay to this day as being my mentor and all the um, wonderful staff that worked in the office um, with her as just pouring into my life and all the other young people's lives that I think really fueled and kind of started my journey. Uh, Robin, if I can, I want to also just comment and kind of go back a little bit to what, Nicole, what you were saying and um, pastor in uh, San Diego, it came from Atlanta, but it takes me back to this thought of one of the things I heard him say with regards to hope. And I think that that's something tangible that has been, that was done for me and that we can do for each other. And that is, um, when we think of the word hope, helping others process and endure. Sometimes that may be all we can do, but that's a powerful thing to do for each other is to just to be there and help us process and endure. And then also if we're in a meeting with another uh, sister and uh, we want to do something tangible, create space to hear that voice and encourage others to listen to the voice. We'll be affirming um, when and where and how we can, just kind of going back to your question with regards to what are some tangible things we can do to support and help each other. And anybody can do that. It could be, it could be your white colleague, it could be your male colleague. Um, mm -hmm. So let's get to, we only have a couple more minutes but we're gonna start the Q and A. So those mm -hmm. of you in the audience who've been waiting to have your questions answered, I, I believe we've been collecting them. Um, uh, I hope somebody's doing it for me because we have a lot of chat over here. Um, uh, real quick, what, uh, what's one book? And I know you probably got five. One book that you would recommend uh, for those uh, joining us here today to read. I love Brene Brown books. Um, I, you know, I'm a student of leadership books. So Dare to Lead is a good one if you haven't read that one. You know, it's about being bold. It's about being vulnerable, showing up. Even, you know, if you win or lose, just continuing to show up. So that's something I think lots of women um, coming from a woman, I think it's just really important to see, you know, how she uh, writes about leadership. So that would be my recommendation for someone to check out. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I personally loved Michelle's book coming because I like seeing her personal journey as a child. I like seeing the family piece, but also the professional and the life and just the career progression. I just, I uh, really enjoyed it. Okay. Well, I actually have a book that I'll hold up. Mm -hmm. We do this till we free us. Uh -huh. And it's really, it is about how we are the ones we've been waiting for. And so how do we as individuals move toward liberation. It's a wonderful book. And Miriam Kaba, I remember when she was in Chicago doing her, her uh, dissertation work, just an amazing, amazingly powerful black woman. All right, in that, uh, Kiana. Yeah, I would um, suggest everyone to read a book called Girl um, by a woman named Kenya Hunt. And the book is, is focused on essays uh, on black womanhood and belonging in the age of, you know, black girl magic. And so mm -hmm. the stories are phenomenal. So I will actually write it here in the chat so everyone can go check it out. Thank you. Okay. It is two or three by Miriam Kaba. And who did I not get yet? Nicole, what you reading? Or what do you say? What do you what have you read that have that other show? You know, I'll leave you guys with two. Um, one, I because I just finished them. I had a month off between. So so when people talk about restoration, I was really had the privilege to have a month off between uh, my old job and my new job. So I was able to read a couple books. One was Heather McGee's The Sum of Us. So I hadn't gotten to that. So when you talk about uh, it's in line with Angelique's recommendation of uh, movement building, how there's this interconnection uh, between how we create a better humanity. And, and there's a lot to learn about uh, racial inequity um, in that work. And then the other one for the feminists on the line, Hood Feminism, uh, which I'm just in the middle of, which is a great, um, uh, a great book just about, again, the role of uh, black and brown women in the feminist movement and the missteps uh, that had happened along the way and how we elbowed our way in and, and just a reorientation of what that means to us. 
uh, as black and brown women? What does feminism mean? What is ours? It's a hood feminism. So. Okay. Did I did I get everybody? One, two, three, four. I think so. I think so. I'm I'm uh, I'm gonna recommend uh, 1619 Project. I, I heard the podcast. I read the the, the uh, New York Times series, New York Times Magazine, but the book uh, has some, some some new stuff in it and. I'm going to recommend that you start a book club at work with all your white colleagues and have everybody read it because it is because it is research based and it really tells it really tells the, the tale of how we we have made America great and if they just listen to us we can we can we can we, we can make it actually great. So, um, questions from the audience. So, if no one has been collecting those, uh, Bianca, I'm talking to you because I got a lot of chat over here. Place them in the Q and A. All right, tell us. Let me see if I find an actual question. We have a lot of comments. Um, thank you so much. What a great audience we have. Um, and while I look for those, okay, Marjorie Blogman says, "Do you have hope that the day will come that women of color will not have this extra struggle on top of what women other women have today?" Ooh. Hope as in helping others process and endure. <laughs> as Cheryl said, that one day, I mean, I, get, I, I do, I do. Um, I, 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 I definitely have hope for that. I think that uh, the evolution of, of human beings has happened so slow that we don't see it in our lifetimes. Um, but I think we're going to act different, think different. We may even look different in the, in the future. And, um, and so, yes, I do have hope that we are, we, are, we have forced this, force folks into glory forever and I think it continues so I have hope let me see what are your professional minutes oh what who are your professional mentors and in what ways do they challenge and support you on your leadership journey I'll start with one of mine um Vicki Lakes Battle she's the executive director at IFF love 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 her she's one of my mentors and I'll say, um, you know, in the last uh, strong conversation she had with me, um, when I was thinking about when I got offered the job at UCAN, and I called her and I'm like, oh, Vicki, I love my company. You know how much I want to do here and I've been here. And she got, she pulled me right together. Um, she, <laughs> she was like, you know, a 150 year old company, you're going to be the first black woman. You have to do this, right? You, there's no doubt about it. Um, you've done great work here. Now it's time for you to 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 go on your next assignment. Um, you know, so my heart was somewhere. My, you know, I I, I had plans um, at another place, um, but I had this wonderful opportunity, and and it took her five seconds. She was on vacation. I called her. She stopped. Um, you know, grabbed the phone and 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 pulled me together and, and got me and got me moving forward. So. You know, and I trust her uh, wholeheartedly to give me the most honest advice when I'm right and when I'm wrong. So, you know, I think for me, she's just one of those people that I call on to get what I need. All right. Um, I love that because we are so loyal, right? You had you had plans where you were. You were here at a five-year outlook and all that, but realize you left a, a, a space for someone else to come in. That was going to be their step up into leadership. Anybody else? Um, on, on how they're supported and challenged by mentor. Yes, Angela. Um, I, I'll give a shout out to Laisha Ward, who is at Target Corporation. When I started at Marshall Fields in the 90s, when there was a Marshall Fields, she was my first boss. I was blessed to have a black woman as a boss. And she pulled me aside. She gave me her suits to wear. She, you know, told me about the chess game that is always being played in corporate America for Black women. And to this day, we were just texting the other night. Um, and she'll ask good questions, Krista, like you said, when I'm considering something, she'll ask questions like nobody else, like, well, where will you, um, you know, serve the most purpose? Where will you, uh, you know, become like the future ancestor. And so mm -hmm. that these are the these are the mentors, you know, that we need. And I think that's what black women offers as mentors. Wow, what a great question. Mm -hmm. Where were you? So someone asked me to share my book. I literally am oh, reading yes. this is an amazing book. I'll mm -hmm. write it in the chat, but it's the 1619 Project, a new origin story. Because you know the story we've been told was 
not exactly a hundred percent complete. Um, and mm -hmm. that is by uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, who mm -hmm. is, uh, I, I mean, this talk about supporting our institutions. What she did with them when she went to Howard at the University of North Carolina was arguing over her tenure for this fellowship. And she was, you know, they well, we'll do this, we won't do that. And they had a big donor that wasn't in favor of her. And when they finally figured out how they were going to have her come, she quit at the last minute and said, no, I'm going to Howard. And mm -hmm. uh, so while always trying to break into somebody else's institutions instead of supporting our own. So that's my plug for Nicole Hannah Jones so, and, mm -hmm. and support her because I'm sure she's got death threats daily. Okay, other questions. Mm -hmm. In those spaces. Oh, wait, I think that was this is a, a second part. To, oh, in those spaces, microaggression or implicit bias could or do show up. Often people create safe spaces that are supposed to be free of those. But those spaces can also be more harmful than good. So in what ways do you disrupt that? Yeah, the term safe space has gotten to be a, a little watered down, I think. Um, I can I can speak to that. So in, in my role and in, in my role at the Wall Street Journal and in other organizations, I hope to um, create trainings that focus on microaggressions and how to deal with them. Uh, and, you know, me being a black woman early into my career, I've dealt with so many and, you know, from ageism to racism, um, you know, it's it's difficult being you know, someone of my age where I want to call it out in a certain way, but then I'm hesitant because I don't want to uh, jeopardize any um, opportunities moving forward. And so I had to be very calculated and intentional about how I go about doing that. And so what I found to work is yet again, like I said, calling in versus calling out. Um, because it really does help to just have the conversation about why it made you feel that way, why it should never happen again. And so, you know, with creating these trainings, I do feel as if they are impactful and effective, but to be honest, you know, going to sit in on a one hour training is not going to change the mind of someone. It's just not realistic. And so the realistic thing to do is to always make sure that your voice is heard not just you know go to a training and then after that go on about your everyday life and continue to do what you've been doing actually apply what you've learned into your professional life into your personal life as well and and it's very hard to to, to get through to someone with whom you have no relationship mm -hmm. and oftentimes the people that are creating a hostile environment are people that you don't want to have a relationship with. Um, so the ability to, to actually find some sort of common ground yeah. is what I found um, is helpful. I was the only black person in editorial meetings in the newsroom for years and years and years. And I was always bringing up the contrary view, um, but I was in a position of power. And that's, that's different, not, we're not as worried. Um, so the worry of losing what you've got is very real and no one should be apologizing for that, I don't think. But, um, but, I, but I think we should acknowledge it as real. Um, and then there's always that, that, there's that, I don't know if it's as true as it is, as it is mentioned often, that sometimes it, it seems like the other women of color or other black women in your organization are not supporting you, that we are, we are, we are we've been placed in a kind of lifeboat situation. There's only so many rations and, you know, very few are gonna be, given to, to, to your group so you better try to get your as big a piece like any like something taken from me is, is something that's given to someone else just because they haven't been a black woman it's just, you know it's actually being given to everyone else but we are pitted against one another um mm -hmm. do you think we pa have we passed that um that kind of unfortunate uh, time period that we support each other mm -hmm. i hope so I, you know i when I think of my uh, mentors, they were peers, yet yeah, they were uh, ahead of me. And, uh, and I'll shout out to Marsha Samuels, Stajal Buheshimu, McKinney Hammond, uh, um, Danelle Scarborough. Those were all people who were um, certainly um, instrumental in helping my growth as my mentors, um, but also would call me out when I needed to be called out on things and I could um, hear their voices. I think that that's a good um, way in which we support each other, Robin. So I'm hoping that we're past that. 
I seem to see in young people less of that. And mm-hmm. that's, that, that's part of what gives me hope, mm-hmm. uh, to, to be honest. Um, so I, we've had uh, a, a great conversation. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I would like to end on something just a little bit light, okay? Or how light it is. When you don't have any, any obligation to anyone or anything, and you have a little bit of time, what do you want to spend it on? I know it's a rare occasion. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have a theory that because in the pandemic we've been so separate from each other and maybe this is just me and my own longing, that many of us are gonna spend the rest of our time on this planet having experiences that you can only have in person, that you can only have with other people, um, that aren't captured on iPhones and aren't shared on platforms. I know for me, I cannot wait to travel with friends. I can't wait to just cook and take care of all of my friends' kids. Um, I can't wait to sit in a theater and see a performance and leap to my feet. I can't wait to be at a concert and just let the music wash over me. I don't wanna record anything and I don't wanna selfie it. I just wanna be in the world and, and taste and experience. And that is what I'm gonna spend the rest of my time doing. Mm-hmm. When you get to free time, anybody else? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I am going to have a really loud bid wits game, if, you know, because <laughs> there's a lot of uh, stuff talking. I'll, I'll be nice in, in bid wits, and you know, you can't be can't be hollering with the, with the, with the virus out here. So much. that's in my in my free time. That's what uh, it, it's like. Your mind can only be right there um, because it does it does tend to focus on things. You know, we multitask a lot, but in their with, I'm just playing their with. So you guys are amazing. I feel like every year I feel like, oh, I've got, I got some more sisters that I can, that I can count in my corner and that I've, I've learned from. You all are amazing. If anybody has any last words they'd like to leave for uh, the folks that are here with us today, first, I want to make sure I didn't miss any questions because I, I really like the internet. What are questions I've got to have? Uh, Robin, sure can I, I say it. one more thing? And I know I just keep talking. Of course. But, um... No, you just talk. Okay, so um, one of the things, and Nicole, I think you got me thinking about this with what, you know, the revolution that you started with the Southside Giving Circle. Um, One of the things that I started last year or two years ago, who knows, um, with my friend Naila uh, Naila Nasir, who runs the Spencer Foundation, is we realized that there are all of these Black and Brown women who are in leadership roles, who run organizations, and have no idea how to manage their money. And that money is this like taboo thing that we're supposed to somehow understand. And some of us even manage investments for large organizations, but we you know, don't actually have conversations about how to negotiate for a job, how to negotiate a raise, how to save money, not just for Uh, a rainy day, but how we get into those investment spaces where the wealthy people are, you know, how to do investments in new economies that are happening, Bitcoin and NFTs and cannabis industry. Like there's so many things that, you know, have uh, extracted from us, Um, even like dividend stocks, someone from my youth council at Skillman, we have a youth council that we are gave money to so that they are the grant makers now. And one of my youth council members who was talking to me about NFTs and Bitcoins was like, well, how many dividend stocks do you own? You know, he's like, I mean, if you're using AT&T, they should be sending you a check every quarter so that you're not just paying them, they're paying you. I was like, okay, start with NFT. <laughs> slow down you know that's right but like what does the end stand for Mm -hmm. i i don't know but how do we open the door to talking about the things that we are supposed to know about because economics run this country and so you know someone asked the question about black women and when will this inequity disappear well when we have ownership stakes when we have market share 
um, that's when we really start disrupting what's happening. So I just wanted to leave with that note, like we've got to be able to learn yes. and talk and that. share how much are we being paid? What are we negotiating for? All that stuff. Mm -hmm. hmm. There are executive organizations that are not specifically focused on black women. And there may be some that I don't know about focused on black women, but I'm thinking that's a grant proposal for the Skillman Foundation to develop this. <laughs> I've got to find it. a young person from Detroit to put it forward. That you, you make a great point. We don't talk about our, our lack of financial right. acumen, just like we don't talk about mental health, right? So, mm -hmm. but, that, but it can all change. Just got to mm -hmm. say it out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Final word? You know, I want to underscore what um, Angelique just shared, but I'll also, I always like to say, there's a quote, I have no idea who, came up with it, but it's just hope is the dream that awakens the soul. Hope is the dream that awakens the soul. And I just encourage us to continue to hope. And I always like to say hope, envision, believe, plan, do. And if we repeat that process, it does move us and not just closer and closer to our destiny. So continue to hope and dream. And do. Mm -hmm. And do. Mm -hmm. All right. Amen. Well, you guys have been amazing. And as I've said like 19 times, I'm, I'm, I'm being very repetitive, but that's because it is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And it's been my pleasure to be here with you today. And I think that you can usually post this so that people who couldn't attend can see it. And also for those who attended and want to see it again can do so. And uh, oh, here's someone proposed a book here, Essays on Black Womanhood and Belonging in the Age of Black Girl Magic by Kenya Hunt. Thank you um, for sharing that, um, Kiana, because I didn't get the whole name of it when you said it. So uh, you guys, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to, I believe Gwendolyn Carver is going to, oh, and I wanna, I wanna thank, uh, I think uh, Claude, I gotta thank Claude because my cousin Claude Robinson uh, keeps this going and, and keeps me involved. Bianca Cotton for her beautiful program management. Uh, Congresswoman Robin Kelly from the mighty, mighty second congressional district of Illinois. And the first woman, the first black woman to head the Democratic Party in the mm -hmm. state of Illinois. I, that might be a glass cliff thing because things are going to be a little rough for the Dems right now, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to hell. Put her in charge. But um, uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank everybody who took time out on a Wednesday morning for the Black Women's Leadership Brunch. And we'll see you all next year. And I hope to see you all between now and then. Thank you, Robin. Gwendolyn. Yes, thank you, Robin. Awesome. And thank you, Robin, for being our moderator today. This has been such a blessing for me personally and professionally. And so I do want to say thank you um, to all of our panelists. I know Robin has already called out the name, so I won't repeat, but I want to say thank you so much. Again, I am Gwendolyn Carver. I'm the Director of Development for UCAN. I am also the co-chair of Pride Alliance, um, an employee resource group that we have at UCAN. Just to share just a few quick nuggets that I received or just highlights from this today's session. Um, some of the things that we as Black women can use, it basically best practices that we should follow, creating those strong sister circles, I think is extremely important. Having a, a mentor gets you a good bottle of wine. I know that some of us <laughs> have mentioned that. <laughs> uh, making sure that you have a good therapist. I, I strongly believe in that. I think that it's important to do. So I agree with you, ladies. Understanding your history. I think for me personally, I need to go back and do my own homework. So thank you for sharing that. Most importantly, following your heart. I think it's important that you follow yourself, follow your energy, be positive, um, using your voice, Kiana, I thank you for that over and over again, just because this year I learned how to use my voice and I will continue to use my voice. And so I encourage everyone else to use their voice, call people out when necessary and support others when necessary. Um, extra, starting your own business that did happen in the pandemic. I have a few friends who started their own business and kudos to everyone who has. Um, Dr. White, you mentioned hope when you think of hope, healing others, um, helping others through the process to endure. I think that is strongly important. Having faith the size of a mustard seed is extremely important. I think we'll all carry that with us. Preparation is key. The list goes on and on and on. I just want to say thank you so much for all of your kind words, the words of inspiration. Uh, please, please, please keep your eyes and ears open for our next 
You Can DEI events that are happening. Thank you so much for joining our It's Me season and our Black Women's Leadership Brunch. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. hmm.